Welcome to the South African Civil Society Information Service. I'm Fazila Farouk, coming to you today from Stellenbosch in the Western Cape. South Africans seem to be facing our moment of reckoning. 20 years of, after apartheid, this country's racial and economic architecture remains unchanged. White South Africans still own much of the wealth of this country, our economy, while black South Africans, apart from a narrow black elite, largely remain in poverty. Our guest today, Professor Sampi Blanche, has been reflecting and writing about South Africa's poverty and inequality for many, many years. We're here today to talk to him about how it is that we've arrived at this point 20 years after democracy, where the status quo in this country hasn't changed. It's actually an opportune moment to be talking to him. A year ago, in fact, a, almost exactly to a day a year ago, his book, Lost in Transformation, was published. And it looks at a 25-year period in South Africa. It looks at the history of our transition to democracy. And Professor Terreblanche has some incredibly special insights into what happened historically in South Africa that informs the current state that the country is in today. Welcome to Saxus, Professor Tablanche. Thank you. Uh, Professor Tablanche, before I ask you to talk about your book, I'd like you to talk a little bit about yourself first for the benefit of our viewers. Tell them about your interest in, in South Africa's political economy and looking at poverty and inequality in South Africa. How is it that this became your area of specialization? Um. Uh, I am Emeritus Professor in Economics at the University of Stellenbosch. I lectured for almost 50 years at the university and uh, I specialized in economic history, history of economic thought and on modern economic systems. I am not lecturing anymore. In April this year I turned 80 years and uh, uh, I can look back on a very interesting and very challenging life up till now. Um, there is a special reason why I'm writing on the poverty problem. It so happened that I was appointed in 1973 as a member of the Erika Tron Commission. It was a commission that looked to the, uh, uh, to the socio-economic position of the colored society in South Africa and I was chairperson of the group on economics and uh, labor and I became interested in the whole pheno phenomena of poverty. I read every American book that was pub published on the poverty problem, the so-called uh, uh, vicious circle of poverty. Uh, I called it uh, the problem of uh, the position of chronicle community poverty. Sorry about it. So in uh, due time I became also interested in the poverty problem in the ranks of the African population group. I published a book in 2002 on the history of inequality in South Africa from 1652 till 2002 and the book has done quite well. Uh, this book, Lost in Transformation, is uh, a rethink about the situation after 10 years. And uh, I have reason to be even more pessimistic as what I have been when I uh, wrote my history of inequality. Well, before I get into um, talking more generally about the book, um, and the issues that you raise in this book. I want to focus on one specific issue. I mean, we're in South Africa at the moment, at a sad moment. Uh, Nelson Mandela is lying on his deathbed, um, and, you know, he unfortunately is not going to see his vision of South Africa, which is a fair and just society. And I want to quote something from your book, something which he said. Um, you say that on 11 February 1990, the day of Nelson Mandela's release from prison, he made the following statement. The white monopoly of political power must be ended 
and we need a fundamental restructuring of our political and economic systems to address the inequalities of apartheid and create a genuine democratic South Africa. That, of course, didn't take place in the last 20 years. And I, I, I want you to focus on one particular thing when you, when you answer this for me today. Um, in the book, you contextualize the statement around the fact that he said this, but soon after that, he was having regular meetings with big capital, Harry Oppenheimer in particular, and you talk about an elite compromise that was reached. I do want you to talk a little bit for the benefit of our audience about the early 90s and the secret meetings and the <coughs> deals that were struck back then uh, between the ANC and capital in South Africa. Because I think that's really very instructive for understanding <coughs> It's yes. very instructive for understanding where we are today, why things haven't changed. The whole transition process was orchestrated by the Mineral Energy Complex. Okay. And with uh, Harry Oppenheimer and to a lesser extent Anton Rupert, they organized everything. Uh, early in the 1990s, uh, there was regular lunches between Mr. Mandela and Harry Oppenheimer. When I became aware of it, I remember I was furious. For what must they have lunches? But these lunches uh, developed into regular meetings at Little Brunt Brunt Brunthurst. It is the, uh, the estate of Harry Oppenheimer. When too many people attend that uh, 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 me secret meetings, the meetings were shifted to the development bank between Johannesburg and Pretoria. Normally at night, uh, uh, it was easy to park the cars at the back side of the building and people on the N1 was not aware of that important meetings that was taking place there. And there the ANC was convinced to forget about their ideas of socialism and large-scale government intervention, etc. You see, America was at, in the beginning of the, the 90s, in a mood of triumphalism. Their attitude was that the American model has won, and that everyone must adapt to the American model. So under the pressure of the South African business sector, with pressure from the Americans that have quite a vested interest in South Africa. Uh, the ANC was, uh, had to cap, to, 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 to give in. You see, uh, if on the question, why have they accepted the new liberal model of the Americans? That is definitely not the correct model for South Africa. Is the, 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 the bargaining power of the business sector and the Americans. But the Americans was also in a position to make use of uh, uh, threatening the ANC. That if you, in a rather diplomatic way, told the ANC, if you are not going to accept our proposals, we can destabilize South Africa. Now, so, and there is a third possibility that no one can, can prove, and I can only spe speculate it. The question is how many money went under the table? So there's the three re reasons. Convincing the NC with arguments, threatening them, and buying them out. Two of, of, of or, or all three was at play at that, that time. Because from, from May 19, uh, 92, from May 92, the ANC published a document ready to govern. In that gov uh, 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 document, it was uh, clear. Uh, previously, the ANC talked about growth through redistribution. In that document of 92, they talk about redistribution through growth. 
And you know, the year policy was announced in uh, 1996, the so-called trickle down. If there is growth in the capitalist sector, uh, then uh, there will be a trickle down to the poor. It is not necessary to have uh, comprehensive redistributive measures. The typical American approach that with growth there will be trickled down. In uh, November 1993, South Africa was governed by the Transitional Executive Committee, the TEC. There was eight National Party ministers and eight senior members of the ANC. And they had a meeting to uh, ask the International Monetary Fund for a loan of $850 million that we need for the transition. And the IMF, it was, of course, everything was arranged, was prepared to give the loan, but uh, they had a document, a statement on economic policy and said, yes, we will give you the money uh, if everyone, every, all 16, sign the document. And if one read that document, uh, statement on economic policy, carefully, it is gear in embryo form. It is the new liberal policy. And so the ANC had no choice. Uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, after, uh, in 1986 already, when Gorbachev and Reagan reached an agreement to uh, seek negotiated settlements for all the flashpoints in the world, after that, uh, uh, Reagan informed the ANC that he can't any longer, the Soviet Union can't any longer support uh, the ANC military and financially. Now the ANC don't want us to, to mention that. As they said, uh, the Gorbachev only told them to, to look for a diplomatic solution instead of a military solution. But uh, the truth is that uh, 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 Gorbachev uh, realized at that stage that the Soviet Union, after the 20 years of Brezhnev, was in a near bankrupt situation. And it is rather remarkable that the American government put quite a lot of pressure on the National Party from Washington, and that Gorbachev from Moscow was putting pressure on the ANC to seek a, a solution. But it was a solution in the end that the Americans want. Professor Tablanche, um, you've been talking about, you know, the pressure that the ANC came under in the early 90s, which forced it, rather than pers persuaded it, to take on a more neoliberal agenda. Um, however, you know, in the last 10 years or so, particularly, the global geopolitics have shifted substantially. South Africa has now also joined the emerging nations, uh, the BRICS group. Um, and, you know, it's a group that's meant to have, uh, uh, meant to be providing a counterbalance in global politics. Why has this new development not in any way influenced the way uh, the South African economy has developed, particularly over the last few years? And why is that not resulting in any changes that benefit more South Africans? You see, America is in such a powerful position. Um, all the countries that became uh, uh, all the colonial uh, colonies that became independent since the Second World War has in fact been recolonized by the American Empire. All these colonies have become satellites, uh, dependent satellites of the American Empire. That financial power, the cooperative power, the military power 
of the United States is so awful. After South Africa has been slotted in, the Americans can't be bothered of what we do, that we join uh, the BRICS countries. I'm a, I think that is a, a large mistake. Uh, if there is in the future a confrontation between BRICS and the United States, the, the, the United States can smash us with their financial power, their cooperative power. They let us do our thing, but they are on themselves content that they have South Africa completely under their control. So let's talk a little bit more in terms of a domestic focus. Let's rather look at capital in South Africa from a domestic perspective. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it will take to bring about some transformation and a bit more of a patriotic orientation in South African capital towards the country? Is it likely to happen? The South African capital sector are doing excellently. The last 20 years, in spite of the uh, great recession in America, the South African capital sector, look at the prices at the stock exchange, has done excellently, but they are now making their huge profits uh, in, in foreign countries. They, uh, they, we, we are a sub-empire of the American empire. South African business uh, corporations have become transnational corporations, have production lines in China, in Poland, in Brazil, everywhere. So uh, uh, we are not our own master any longer. What about then the power of the people and particularly the power of um, more empowered groups in South Africa, for example, South Africa's middle class? Do you see any potential for a call for change coming from South Africa's middle class? In, in, in South Africa's middle class, you see, uh, let me put it this way, that 20% of the population is the rich elite. Then there are 30% that's neither here nor there. They are what one can call a petite bourgeois. And then there is the 50% that is very much impoverished. Now that tw top 20%, 10 million people, received 75% of total income. Uh, 3,7 million of them are white and uh, uh, 6,3 million are black. But the whites are the richer part of that group. The lower 50% of the population received only 8% of less than 8% of total income. Now, it is a shocking situation. Um, uh, what we had a political transformation. Apartheid has been abolished, but the political economic system that was put in its place uh, is an, an ANC dominated political system and an economic system that have become internationalized, that became Americanized. So, from the point of view of the lower 50%, nothing of worth has happened. Yes, I must say, there is the uh, uh, social grants for elderly people and the social grants for, for children. That's the only positive thing that happened. But it is not good enough. The, the living conditions of that lower 50%, uh, 25 million people, of which 24 million is Africans, are rather shocking. I'd like to shift the conversation a little bit to talking about solutions, possibly. Um, when we were talking earlier on in preparation for the interview, you said that you are going to be reprinting your 
book and it's going to be translated into Afrikaans and you're going to be adding a few extra pages, a new chapter if you like, and you're going to be uh, talking a little bit about solutions. I'd really like you to tell us you know, what you're going to cover by way of you know, resolving the problems we face in South Africa. But also, in addition to that, uh, an interesting thing that you mentioned to me was um, in 1997, you made a presentation at the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And in talking about South Africa's problems there, what you uh, suggested was that we needed a wealth tax. Can you elaborate on that also? Yes, um, I gave evidence in uh, November 1997, a 20-page document. I had the opportunity to read it to the audience. There were business people, the uh, Anglo-American and others were there. They were furious of what I was saying. And in the end, I proposed a wealth tax. Now, uh, people are saying, some rich people, we shouldn't have been so uh, negative about somebody's wealth tax. But it's now too late. But it, it, uh, the government need more money to upgrade the living conditions of the poor. 